The history of the American West is the story of our great western rivers. The river most crucial to this story is the Missouri, a river of promise, dreams, and a highway into the West. The earliest inhabitants of the area, Native Americans, raised crops and hunted bison along the river and the surrounding plains. During the 1700s, the river attracted explorers and traders moving west, seeking their fortune. In 1803, the most famous western explorers of all, Army Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, met with the Yankton Sioux tribe in an encampment below Calumet Bluff, just a short distance from the visitor center where you're watching this movie today. Along with the opportunities the Missouri provided came the trials and destruction of flood and drought that plagued the river and its residents. The floods would continue periodically more than halfway into the 20th century until the United States Army Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation proposed to address the problems that both flooding and drought caused the region. The first dam built on the Missouri, Montana's Fort Peck, was built by the WPA during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Five other massive earthen dams below Fort Peck followed after Congress passed the Flood Control Act of 1944, commonly called the Pick Sloan Plan for its co-authors, Major General Lewis Pick of the Corps and William Sloan of the Bureau of Reclamation. Gavin's Point was the third of the five Pick Sloan dams to be built. Although it is the smallest and the furthest downstream, it plays an important role in flood control, power generation, and providing a steady flow of water for irrigation, recreation, wildlife management, barge traffic, and city water supplies all the way to St. Louis. When the Corps began exploratory drilling, it was thought the dam would be built two miles upstream of the current location. The north end of the dam would be at a point on the South Dakota shore, then owned by Irish immigrant Michael Gavin. The site ultimately selected, however, was at Calumet Bluff. Because of the location of two islands in the river, that would aid in construction. On May 18, 1952, construction officially began. As nearly 8,000 people joined Nebraska Governor Val Peterson and South Dakota Governor Sigurd Anderson at groundbreaking ceremonies on Calumet Bluff. General Pick symbolically commenced the earth moving work by setting off a charge of dynamite. U.S. Senators Carl Munt and Chan Gurney, who helped push through the initial two million federal dollars for the project, were in attendance. The access road to Calumet Bluff, now part of Nebraska Highway 121, was improved to handle heavy equipment, and excavation of chalk rock and dirt from the bluff began. The earth fill was hauled by huge bottom dump trucks and was used to create an enormous embankment across the river from Calumet Bluff to the first of the two islands. The smaller island was reached within six weeks and closed off the south chute of the Missouri. Three-fourths of the river now flowed in the channel between the two islands, creating an extremely powerful current. The Corps built a dike upstream to divert the flow of the water north towards the other side of the large island nearest the South Dakota shore. Giant trucks and bulldozers maneuvered just a few feet from the raging river. The completion of another dike between the islands brought the seven-week struggle to block the middle channel to an end. Dam building could commence at full speed. Meanwhile, in the area above the dam, the clearing of buildings and large trees had begun. Equipment and tractors transformed the former farmland purchased for the reservoir. While some buildings were demolished, others were moved for their owners to higher ground. One resident followed along to make sure that a bird and nest on his porch would make the move undisturbed. A year after the groundbreaking, 
the 850-foot wide embankment extended from Calumet Bluff to the large island. As excavated earth and chalk were transported to the growing embankment, other workers carved Calumet Bluff to accommodate the dam's power plant and spillway. Work progressed quickly thanks to extraordinary equipment and personnel. A new type of cutter head was used to dredge away chalk underwater and an electric coal saw sliced away the bluff. By August 1953, the earthen embankment extended to a point more than halfway between the large island and the South Dakota shore. And for the next two years, the Corps of Engineers turned its attention to the spillways and power plant structures. Massive pillars of concrete, 110 feet tall, were erected on the river bottom below Calumet Bluff as part of the powerhouse intake structure. To the north, the massive abutments of the 13 piers of the spillway took shape. They stood 70 feet high, like a row of sentries of the Missouri River Valley. 14 steel spillway gates, each 30 feet wide and 40 feet high, weighing 23 tons, were mounted between the piers. Temporary levees on both sides of the dam were now cut away, allowing the water to flow through the intakes on the dam. While work was being completed on the concrete structures, drag lines and trucks began moving earth and chalk to the site of the final closure. Working from the shoreline and the dam, drag lines placed more than 1,000 cubic yards of earth and chalk each hour. Working around the clock, they eventually transported more than 7 million cubic yards of earth for the construction of Gavin's Point Dam. As the final closure neared on July 30th, 1955, crowds began to gather on the South Dakota shore, many staying through the night, watching by floodlight. Until at 4.05 a.m. on July 31st, the gap was closed. By mid-morning, 7,000 people had come to celebrate. Closure of the 8,700-foot-long dam was complete. Power plant turbines, too big to cross the Yankton Bridge, were hauled in through Nebraska, and officials celebrated the first energy generation from the dam in 1956. The last construction would be completed in August 1957, bringing the total cost of the project to about $50 million. Today, Gavin's Point Dam is still impressive. More than a mile and a half long, 850 feet thick at its base, and 74 feet high, the concrete spillway with its massive gates is wider than two football fields. Three generators produce enough power for 30,000 homes. Lewis and Clark Lake, with its 90 miles of shoreline, reaches 25 miles upstream and covers more than 32,000 acres. Nearly two million visitors annually come from all over to enjoy fishing, camping, boating, and other recreation at and near Lewis and Clark Lake. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers welcomes you to the Visitor Center at beautiful Lewis and Clark Lake.